Mohammed, your colleague, Bill Gross, uh, tweeted this out yesterday, which I thought was quite interesting. He said, quote, sell the euro, buy five-year treasuries, and stocks are out of gas unless confidence restored, knowing that we are near record highs again for the S&P and the Dow. You agree with him? Yeah, I do. And what that reflects is that we are in a very artificial time for markets. So suppose three months ago I would have told you stocks would be up 11% for the quarter, the 10-year would be still at 185, the boon would be at 126, and gold would be above 1600. Most people would have said that combination is not possible. Right. Right. But it has happened. Why? Because it's not just about growth and top, lev top revenue. It's also critically about the role of central banks. And what we're seeing now is this combination. So in order to get further, we need a few things. We need, first and foremost, a handoff from assisted growth to real growth. That's what maintains the stock market. Well, on do this you feel like we're getting real growth? I think we're getting closer in terms of endogenous healing. Okay. But there's so many headwinds, including politics. Yeah. And secondly, we need Europe to find a solution. Right? So if you put all that together, you get this notion that be careful of the euro. You'd rather be short than long at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you're betting on equities, you're betting on this handoff. Well, it's interesting you say about, about Europe and what's going on there, because I was at a conference yesterday, a Credit Suisse conference, and, and a lot of the talk was about Europe and, and the global economy. And some of the participants there said, look, we don't expect Europe to really recover for another six to ten years. We could be talking maybe even about a lost decade here in Europe. So if you're waiting for Europe to be resolved to get into the markets, you could be waiting a long time. Yeah, but you've got to understand, Europe is the biggest economic zone or region in the world. Right. So if you it's bigger are bigger than the US. If it's bigger, so if you're going to write it off for eight to ten years, okay, you need someone else to step in. So you need America to grow not at two, but at three and three and a half percent, and you need the emerging world to recover quite quickly. So you can write it off but you have to make sure that you can decouple the rest of the world. And that is a really difficult thing because we are so interconnected these days. Uh, we are. And, you know, another point that was interesting just to just to, on a final note on this conference was they had done a survey of their clients here in the U.S. and also in Asia. What was interesting was that the biggest risk that U.S. investors saw was, uh, was, was what's going on in, uh, in Europe, but also in the Middle East. They felt those two were the biggest risks. Asian investors said inflation was their biggest risk. That made sense to me. Does it make sense to you? Oh, it makes absolute sense because if you are in the emerging world, you feel that you're being forced into more stimulative monetary policies because of what the Fed is doing. Because your other choice of letting your exactly. currency appreciate dampens growth. So yeah, if I'm sitting anywhere in Asia, that's what I'm going to be worried about. Inflation and North Korea. Don't Let's not forget North yes, Korea. Yes, that's true. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I want to play for you, Mohammed, um, one comment that we heard from Ben Bernanke out of the press conference last week, the Fed chairman. This is what he said about the, uh, the quantitative easing. In the committee's view, these costs remain manageable, but will continue to be monitored as, uh, and we will take them into appropriate account as we determine the size, pace, and composition of our asset purchases. So he's talking about the exit strategy for the Fed. Do you still feel that they've got a handle on how to manage their asset purchase program? So he's worried about two things, and, and Chairman Bernanke has been very honest about unconventional policies. Back in August 2010, in Jackson Hole, he said, when you go unconventional, you have to look at, quote, the benefit, costs, and risks. So the first thing they're worried about is at what point are the benefits exceeded by the costs and risks? And we just heard him say, so far the costs are manageable, mm -hmm. but we're keeping an eye on them. So that's the first issue, right? The second issue is how do you determine when to exit, right? Because you've got not just QE, you've got interest rates floored at zero, and right. you've got very aggressive forward guidance. And how do you exit from all three. And I think they're going to have to make it up as they go along. I, I say this is the... What does that mean, though, make it up as they go along? So the Fed basically is like a pharmaceutical company that was forced to bring medication to the market that has not been clinically tested. So they're not sure as to what the longer-term effects are. They're not sure what the collateral damage is. So they have to course correct as they get more information every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've been doing. If you had told people that at QE2, you would get Operation Twist, you would get QE3. People would have said, no, you won't. Right. But we did. And I think it's important to, to recognize that this is unprecedented. That's why markets right now are at artificial levels, because 
the Fed is not just a referee of the system, it is a big player. It is on the field, refing and playing at the same time. Well, Mohammed, would you say, given the easy monetary policy uh, here in the U.S., but also in other countries, particularly Japan, let's say, I know there's a bit they're debating about it, but in Japan, would you agree that the U going long, let's say, on U.S. equities and on Japanese equities might be the easiest trade to do right now? It is if, if you believe in three things. One is that the policies will work, so we'll get this handoff from assisted growth to genuine growth. Secondly, that the central banks won't break something in the process. <laughs> and the fact that Japan had to do a U-turn yes. signals to you okay, that this is a really complicated thing. And thirdly, you've got to assume that the exogenous issues, Europe, geopolitics, okay, remain just small headwinds, not big headwinds. If you mm. believe that, that's the trade. If you do not believe that, you take a much more diversified approach you maintain optionality because things are going to play out, and you keep an eye on the inflation risk down the road. It's not so, immediate. where do you are you on the more optimistic side then, or the pessimistic side? We have this view that we are on this road to a junction, and it's very uncertain right now which way the economy is going to head in the junction. In one way, it's the recovery road; the other way, it's bad things. <laughs> okay, so we are maintaining optionality. We yeah. are reducing risk. Okay, risk assets have had a wonderful run, and we are putting on inflation protection. We're seeing these jobs claims sort of struggle around these levels, right? We thought for a while we were headed lower and lower here. What do you make of that? Well, slightly disappointing, these numbers, slightly. Okay, now why, is that, why are these numbers so important? Because we are sequentially healing. So the corporate sector, the large corporation healed first, then the banks, the housing market is healing, and now critically the households have to heal. Hmm. And employment is key to the healing of the households. And as we see today, yes, we are healing, but we're healing very slowly. Yeah. Well, what, what could possibly accelerate this? We're certainly not getting a lot of help out of Washington here. So we're going to have a good discussion. Um, the key yes. thing is to turn headwinds into tailwinds. And what are the headwinds? Well, some come from abroad, Europe, geopolitical issues, but some are of our own making including the sequester, including the lack of a congressional consensus mm -hmm. on removing structural impediments. So the key issue is to turn headwinds into tailwinds. Well, when do, when, when do you believe we're going to really start to see those automatic spending cuts really take hold in the economy and start to create not just pain in the economy, but also pain in Washington seeing this? So I think they take hold slowly, and that's why we, we're not going to get pain in Washington. And we're going to have a good discussion yes. um, coming Very up with Leader Cantor, yes. which is who takes the leadership role in Congress, right? Because this is not something that's going to occur w without some leadership within Congress. Mm. And it's absolutely critical that we get it.